Welcome to the Faith Matters uh, lecture. Uh, this evening, Dr. Enrique Zone, uh, one of our associate deans in the School of Theology, will be presenting uh, the results of his research uh, on his most recent sabbatical, Diary of an Immigrant, Dancing with the Culture. As I look back over the Faith Matters lecture series, especially in the last couple of years, immigration and immigration issues has been a focus. Um, so if you haven't been to some of those lectures, let me review for you uh, the, the lectures in 2018-19 and 2019-20, the, the titles. Uh, in in uh, 2018-19, uh, Dr. Justin Ashworth, presented this, Immigration Controversies, How to Think Theologically About Family Separation, Travel Bans, and Activism. Unfortunately, last year we only had one uh, Faith Matters lecture, uh, so I skip forward now to 2019-20. In the fall, Dr. Uni Lee uh, presented Ruth the Moabite and the Immigrant Experience, and again tonight then Dr. Enrique Zone will present Diary of an Immigrant Dancing with the Culture. A couple of things, many of you know Dr. Zone uh, and are, uh, are friends of his like I am, but a couple of things that I wanted to um, pull out from his CV that I thought were worth mentioning. Uh, first of all, his 1996 uh, Doctor of Education uh, dissertation title at Pepperdine University uh, is this, suggested, uh, suggested competencies for the Hispanic Protestant church leader of the future. Um, and of course, Knowing what Dr. Zone does for a living and how well he does it, we find that uh, this is a, probably a continuing work over the last uh, 24 years. Dr. Zone, of course, has the Doctor of Education from Pepperdine. He did an MDiv and an MA uh, here at Azusa Pacific. He did an MA at Fuller Theological Seminary and did his undergraduate work at Life Bible College. Now, I am not going to make um, any statements about how old Dr. Zone is. <laughs> but it was interesting to me, um, and, and I, I, I mean this, this is really interesting to me that a, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Andre Crouch came up in our conversation, and Dr. Zone knew Andre personally, uh, as, it, as it turns out. And uh, so maybe next year you can do another Faith Matters lecture on Andre Crouch. Um, he is an ordained minister in the International Church of the Foursquare Gospel. He has a list of accolades and publications that are too long for me uh, to, to review. Um, and before I invite my friend Dr. Zone up, I was just reading this today and I, I, I thought it was a perfect way to, to think about what he does and, and uh, the value he brings to Azusa Pacific University and to the seminary in particular. Dan Aylshire wrote in 2018, now Dr. Aylshire was the past president of the Association of Theological Schools. He wrote in 2018 uh, in an article entitled The Emerging Model of Formational Theological Education in the, the journal Theological Education. How will changes in culture, religion, and higher education influence theological education? I am, of course, not sure, but my hypothesis is that the next pattern of theological education will not be understood as professional education in the way the current model has been. He goes on to say, Henry Nouwen, in an era of increasing complexity in society and fragmentation in religion, argued for the importance of authenticity. And this is what struck me about you, my friend. The minister, he wrote, can make this search for authenticity possible, not by standing to the side as a neutral screen or impartial observer, but as an articulate witness to Christ who puts his own search at the disposal of others. Another part of the article, uh, uh, Dr. Aylshire quotes William Sullivan from the study Educating Clergy. And with this, I will turn the mic to you. The clergy's area of expertise lies not in physical or information systems, but in a world of social practices structured by shared meanings, purposes, and loyalties. These social networks form a distinctive ecology of human life and are the matrix of individual identity and purpose. And these two statements reminded me so much of you. I thought they were appropriate for tonight. Can we welcome our friend, our mentor, our professor, Dr. Enrique Zeno. Thank you. That was, that was not hard at all. Thank you, Dr. Ragsdale. That didn't hurt at all. 
he uh, thought he had threatened me with an introduction that I would never be able to uh, forget. But uh, Well, I am not bringing to you a political discourse on immigration. I'm not bringing to you um, anything but my experience as an immigrant in this country. There's a statement by Yang Li that says that it's important for us to live out our theology, to practice our theology. Theology must be incarnational. And so I will touch some points here and there that have to do with the state of, of, the, of the church and immigration, but mostly this is my story. Now we have a, a problem that I need to take care of right off the bat. We have a mixed audience. We have some who do not speak a word of English and others who do not speak a word of Spanish. So from this side, I will speak in English, and from this side, I'll... so if you would like to now move to where you need to be. So I will, um, you know, this really is, is, is really frightening because I pastored a church in Reseda many years ago, and it was a bilingual church. For me, it was actually suicide by design because at the end of every service in the morning, I would, I would hear the following comments. Pastor, the, 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 the message was great, but you know, uh, would you give us a little bit more English? Because the custom was to speak in Spanish and then you translate yourself, you go back and forth. Then another one would come to me and would say, you know, it was great, but we, we need more of, uh, of the Spanish. And then the third person would come to me and would say, can you make up your mind? <laughs> so I went through this uh, for five years. And uh, luckily, when the Lord moved us from Reseda to uh, Montebello, of course, his English services, we, we entertained the Hispanic language and the culture in our social events. But the pulpit and the service was strictly in English, as it is today. And I, I learned the lesson that you can't mix the languages too much. You can only go so far. And by the way, the church in Reseda did not grow over 120 people because it's very difficult to grow a church when you're using two languages. And there's a lot more that can be said about that, but I don't want to take the time to do it. But that's what you remind me of today. So what I'm going to do, oh yeah, part of the comment was you did not translate yourself correctly. I forgot to tell you that. So. So what I'm going to do today, I am going to say things in English, in English. And then I may just move a little bit in Spanish. But whatever I say in English, I will not say in Spanish. And what I say in Spanish, I will not say in English. Ah, yeah, that's my, my small vengeance today, you know. So. Uh, but I'll, I'll be fair, and I'll do the best I can. I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Bobby Duke, our dean, Robert Duke, for enabling a sabbatical that made all of this possible. And I'm thankful that I was able to take the time out to do research that led to this book, which will be available in Amazon. There is a statement that I'd like to read to you. It comes from Young Lee. It says, theology, theology is autobiographic, 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 but it's not an autobiography. My theology is not just a story of my life. It is a story of my faith journey in the world. It is how God formed me, nurtures me, guides me, loves me, allows me to age, and will end my life. So I'm speaking about what it means to live the life of an immigrant. So these are selected pages from a diary that I kept for many years. It's a diary of an immigrant. But what I've done, I tailored it so that it correspond to the development of what it means to be a bicultural leader, bicultural principles. I would like to emphasize that when I came to this country, I was a complete human being. Why do I say that? Because sometimes we feel like until we don't become something that we recognize, well, they're not really totally human. And those of us who have gone through the experience of immigration and have come to 
a setting which is quite different. Sometimes have to prove over and over and over again that they're just part of the human race like everybody else except with cultural differences. Hotsteed is the guy that helped us tremendously back in 1980 when he came out with a book addressing the different dimensions of nationality. And he also spoke about the importance of cultural organizations or the culture of organizations, something that was not available at that time. And he, he draws this analogy and he says that uh, all of us are part of the human race and our human race is universal and it's inherited. We're all alike, we're all human beings. Then the next step is culture and culture is a bit different because culture can be specific to a group different from the other. And culture is always learned. We received our learning, a cultural learning, when we grow up in the home. It's called acculturation. It is the way in which we discover how to live in the world where we happen to, where we happen to be born. So when I was a little baby, I heard my mother, I heard my dad, hurt my grandparents, I hurt people around me, and it gave me the cues to understand who I, who I was and gave me the idea that I belonged to a society, a very particular society. It was an Argentine society, and that's where I lived, that's where I grew up. Then there's a third level, which is called personality, which is something that is very specific to the individual, and of course, it is inherited and it's also learned. And if I could sing, I would sing right now, and I've got personality, but I'm not going to do that. Um, be, but it's true, everybody has a unique personality, and sometimes personality is confused with culture. And sometimes we, we try to stereotype people by the way they behave, by their personality, and not by their culture. Moving on, the same author gives us something very special. He says that culture is uh, manifested in different levels. What I like about this design is that he says that all of us have, that culture is, has symbols, heroes, has rituals, and values. And not to go into great detail of what they all mean, symbols are the most superficial things we see about other people. Words, gestures, the, in society we see the flag, etc. When we come to heroes, we, we, the people that we honor and we appreciate in our cultures. I, I was preaching on Sunday morning and everybody was crying in the church and I thought it was my great message. And no, everybody was weeping because of the death of a great athlete and an icon all over the world. Those are the heroes. In our countries, we all have our own heroes, different one from the other. Then we have the rituals, and uh, the rituals are, of course, uh, things we do that uh, are per pertain to culture and to ourselves. Uh, I have a ritual myself, and I almost brought it here, but you've seen me all the time with it, and this time I wanted to show you that I could live without it, my mate. Mate is a drink, but it's, it's, I left it. And the, the important thing is that the, the practices, or the way in which we function with symbols, heroes, and rituals, the cultural practices come from values. And values are quite a formidable, formidable, formidable enterprise. So uh, we learn very young uh, evil versus good. What is evil in one society is different from the other. Uh, dirty versus clean. I could give you examples in my travel as to things that people do in their culture, which for me are not clean, and for them it's just as clean as could be. Uh, dangerous versus safe, forbidden versus permitted, decent versus indecent, moral versus immoral, ugly versus beautiful, unnatural versus natural, abnormal versus normal, Paradoxical versus logical, irrational versus rational. Those are the way in which we construct our values. And those are inculcated as we grow up, as we're babies and we grow up. And things are told to us, mijo, no hagas esto. Esto está mal. In one society, 
is bad. In another society, it's good. Those are the values that we process. So depends where you, where you grow up. You will have different types of values that will be practiced in those other areas that we mentioned at the beginning. So when it comes to my life, which is what we're all here to find out, my mother is English. My father, Italian, spoke Spanish, Argentinian. I'm European descent, guilty as charged. In Argentina, 83% of the population is European descent. It's awful what happened to the Aborigines of that area. It's awful what they did years ago, centuries ago. But the fact is that that's the way Argentina is today. But one of the amazing things about my birth, oh my, not my birth, was that I was not born in a, in a, in a home that was Catholic, because usually uh, everybody in Argentina is born in a Catholic home. I was born in a Christian home, or I put it here, non-Catholic Christian. I happen to believe the Catholics are Christian too, which is an evolution in my thinking, because that's not the way I thought years ago. But the fact is that this experience of not being born, or being born in a country and not being Catholic, produced significant distress in all of our lives. My grandparents were missionaries from England. They met in Argentina, but they, were, they both came from England. One came from Bristol. Grandma and my grandfather from my mother's side came from London. And um, they started the first evangelical church in the city of Mar del Plata in 1915. I was there for the 100th anniversary, and I spoke. Um, their, their life was quite uh, an adventurous life, but again, it was pre-Vatican II, and religious persecution was acute, as it also was in my days. And because I was the grandfather of the pastor, of the founder, I was fair game for all kinds of, of persecution and issues. However, at the age of five, I had an encounter with the Lord. My grandmother used to read the Bible to me, and she would treat me as an adult. Remember that uh, in England, in the 1800s, there was really no childhood. Everybody worked very hard. Even as children, they worked. And so grandma didn't think of me necessarily as a little child, but she spoke to me as an adult, and she expected things from me as an adult, believe it or not. And so reading to me the Bible and telling me stories, she took that very seriously. And in one day, which I remember and I cite in the book, I asked her if there was any way that I could get to know Jesus. She was alarmed by the question. She was not expecting it. But when she heard my question, she said, yes. And she prayed with me. And I don't know how to tell you this, but I felt from that moment on that God was working in my life. Five years old. When I was eight years old, there was a special service going on in the church, and it was this man who was a wonderful preacher of the gospel, and he spoke about giving your life to God for service. And I felt like I wanted to serve the Lord, but in a particular way. I wanted to be a medical doctor. My dream was to be an MD, not an EDD. Life. So I went forward, and they prayed for me, and I said, I want the Lord to use me as a medical doctor. I want to be a missionary. I want to be a missionary doctor. See, I'd heard the stories about David Livingstone. I don't know how many know about David Livingstone, but if you don't know about David Livingstone, you can ask our dean who has every answer for every question that you may have. <laughs> and uh, he was a great missionary to Africa and gave his life to Africa. And when he died, uh, he wanted his heart to be buried in Africa, and the rest of his body was shipped to England. And, and I, I was so overwhelmed by that story that I wanted to be someone who could help society. So I said to myself, I am going to be a medical doctor, and that's how I'm going to serve the Lord. But again, going back to the issues of the country, um, there were, are great differences, uh, different threads of Roman Catholicism around the world and in Argentina, it was a totalitarian approach to everything in life. You see, at that time, 
Evita, you all don't cry for me, Argentina? You should. But anyway, Evita and Eva Perón and Juan Domingo Perón and the Pope and the Vatican had uh, joined forces. And um, Perón gave unprecedented power to the church. And that's a reward after being elected. It was awful because everything was Catholic. See, this was not the Catholic faith. No, it wasn't. It, it, was, it, it was a horrified version of Catholicism. So there was Catholic persecution to the right and to the left in all aspects of my life, in all aspects of everyone's life. And they controlled everything. It was a totalitarian church and government. Peron said one time, after Evita came from Spain, she said, ha, ah, wonderful. The sword and the cross have united again. We will provide guidance to our country. Every aspect of social life had this Roman Catholic filter. So persecution was hard. I would, <laughs> bloody noses, uh, fights in school, uh, bullying, uh, harassment. Uh, people would, would see me come in the street and they would, um, uh, they would do the sign of the cross, and walk on the other side. Persona non grata, not just me, but my brother Richard and my sister Susan. And so was my mother and my father and all of us who were evangelicals. Nobody knows what religious persecution is unless you go through it. When the government gets involved with religion and religion gets involved with the government, it is a deadly thing. That was Argentina for us. Uh, persecution was normative and in school I wanted to be an MD. And in order for me to get into the university, I had to go through three tests. The first test was, I had to have good health, and I had always, I've always had good, good health, so I could pass the test. Secondly, I had to do physical exercises, and I could do that. As a matter of fact, um, my colleague, Brother Brian, and myself, we, we, in the month of May, were both running the 50-yard dash, and whoever wins, wins. But there was another problem. The way, in order to get into the school, a university, I had to go through the cultural test, which was the question, are you a Roman Catholic? And because I was not a Roman Catholic, I would never be admitted to medical school or to a university in Argentina. Our education was not available to me. The, the, the control was such. The government, I mean, they would control the, the books you would read in kindergarten all the way to the books that you would read in the university. They would control how much a pound of sugar would cost or a gallon and a gallon of oil. It was a control was just control, absolute control. And so they said to me, you're not going to be a medical doctor, and they would laugh at me. You're going to be what we will tell you what to be. You can imagine how well I received that. Well, none of us received that well, but we were stuck. We were really stuck. Um, they said to me, the best thing that happened to you is to go to military service, join the military ranks, and become a good private, and you'll be a gardener for one of the lieutenants, and that will be a great place for you. Yeah, hasta la vista, baby. Uh, because um, this is what happened. Give me your tired, your poor, your head of masses yearning to breathe free. My mother was an English teacher and she taught classes and uh, she would teach classes, people would gather from the city uh, and, and it, was, um, it was a desire for those people who would learn the English language to come to the States or to go to England. And so they would learn the language. And there is where she found out, as we all heard, that here in America you could come and you can find gold in the streets. That money was everywhere. That this was the land of opportunity where you will be embraced and loved and cherished, appreciated, and this was the place, this is the destiny after heaven, America. Yeah, okay. So it took us seven, actually it took us four years to get all of our papers lined up and, uh, and money and documents until finally we were granted a visa. Actually, we were residents. We became residents 
We came in into this country as residents. I've never not had a green card, but I'm a naturalized citizen now. But I, I came in through the gates that the government had put before us. So we thought we were in very good territory. I mean, everything was going to be absolutely beautiful. And uh, well, the trip was kind of rough. That's way over there, Buenos Aires. Necoche is my place of birth, but way from over there all the way up to California. But that figure is not correct because in those days there were no jets, 1959, and they were just coming out. So it was four f f prop, super constellation. Made so much noise and we went from, from Buenos Aires to Sao Paulo, Brazil. From Sao Paulo to Brazil, uh, 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 to Rio de Janeiro. From Rio de Janeiro, no, to Brasilia. Then from Brasilia, we jumped all the way to Peru. Then from Peru, we went to Panama. And from Panama, we went to Mexico. And then we finally landed yeah, a day and a half. But you know what? We came. And all of a sudden, I found myself in a much different place that I ever thought possible that I could ever be. I did not have any type of problems as far as religion was concerned. I did not suffer any religious persecution, but I became quickly, quickly aware of something else, and it was the problem of discrimination and assimilation. And it was a rough time in my life. As a matter of fact, I still think it's rough because people have a certain perception of who you are. And society are the ones that tell you this is who you are. And when society says this is who you are and you're not that, there is a conflict. And in those days, there were several theories of acculturation going on. Let's see if I can at least touch a couple of them. It was the Anglo conformity, you know, manifest destiny, you must be just like this. Then the melting pot philosophy was going on that we're all in a big old huge pot and we're all being fused together and out will jump an American. And then was cultural pluralism that was there and very much like mosaic society, at least cultural pluralism says that you can keep your culture and keep on moving and the mosaic society says about the same thing with a little bit more elasticity. But I uncovered in 1980 something that I feel much more comfortable that I believe this could be one of our answers to our problems of assimilation, which is not really assimilation, it is called nothing more than the, the universal American society where all of us, this is America, we all share this thing in common, and these are different ethnicities that come together, but this is common ground where we share all of this. This is our particular different concepts of life, of culture, it's what we bring from our countries. But this is the major place where we meet together. Society, the Mosaic Society doesn't quite do that for me anyway. So that was what I faced. I faced a, a, a very important process of assimilation, a very process, a, a process of becoming part of this country. And, and this is the best draft that I could put together. Ethnic identity is formed in culture of origin eight years and up. A los ocho años, oh, I have to go in. Spanish. A los ocho años ya estamos formados y venimos a este país ya hechos y no hay nada que nos puede evitar de ser lo que somos de nacimiento. No se lo puede borrar, no se lo puede quitar, no importa cuántos baños se da, no se le va. Sí, that's the Spanish language, see, it's... Because, see, humor is very cultural. Culture is very much an indicator of how you communicate in, in, those, in, in those areas. Well, look, look at this. First of all, it's immigration, right? Immigration comes. You, you come to the States with your ethnic ethnicity, you immigrate, and then you have an identity crisis precipitated by assimilation stress and discrimination. You have choices to make. You're going to go and preserve your ethnic culture, or you're going to blend and become a pure U.S. culture person, which I believe it's impossible. So there's a, a tension here. It's a bifurcated stage between one and the other. The next step would be conflict, because you're trying to find out where am I going to land in this world, in this life? And so you have exploration and adaptation stage. And so 
you, you, you need to, to see which, which way you're going to go. Are, are you going to, oh my goodness, are you going to be ethnic separated or are you going to be national assimilated? And there's this, this tension until finally, I believe, is the adjustment period where you're, you have your ethnic and you have your U.S. culture and here is where you form your identity. This process takes years. It's not down from one day to the other. It takes literally years. Years and years and years and suffering and pain. Como dicen en Guatemala, puchica vos. Very difficult. So the first years in this country, I went, was going through all this process of contact and conflict and adjustment. And as I arrived in sixth grade, they were going to put me in seventh grade because of my math abilities, and, but seventh grade was a little bit too complicated. Socialization was not better than sixth grade. That uh, they said to me, um, I'm going to sixth grade. And so I went to sixth grade and I sat there. I understood. I understood. I took English. I had about 50 words that I could um, handle. But my ear was accustomed because my mother taught English, so did my grandfather and my grandma. There was English. I could understand it, but I couldn't really speak it. So in sixth grade, they said, all right, everybody, I want all of you to know that we have a brand new student in our midst. His name is Enrique. That's a hard name to pronounce. So we're going to call him Ricky. <laughs> like Ricky Nelson <laughs> or Ricky Ricardo. <laughs> um, at the same time, I want all of you to know that though he doesn't read Spanish, I mean English, or um, English, read, write, speak, talk, whatever. Uh, we have to respect him. Look, you look at him and, well, just think of him as a Mexican, but white. <laughs> Yo, un mexicano blanco, soy argentino. I couldn't believe the type of language they were using in those days. And of course, I was not really allowed to speak in Spanish. And my father had received notice from his friends at work that he should forbid us to speak Spanish because it happened to him, this worker where my father was, uh, was working in the States, says, watch out because when I spoke Spanish, my teacher took me to the bathroom and washed my face and my mouth with soap because it was forbidden for you to speak that language. So my father panicked and said, no hablen español. And I said, no, voy a hablar castellano. <laughs> Don't speak Spanish. No, I'm going to speak Castilian, which is the same thing as Spanish. It was rough. Well, wait till I told him that I wanted to be a medical doctor. Well, as, as I go on with this, uh, I, I just need to move on. I, 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 when I mentioned the fact to the high school, now we're in high school, I want to be a medical doctor. They said, you know, you, that's a very difficult thing for you to ever become. We have a better idea for you. I said, what, are we going to Argentina all over again? They said, you know, you're from Argentina. There we go. There we go. You're from Argentina. So I had been pigeonholed and I was told, you know, you, are, you could be the best gardener in the world. But you need to, you need to work with the Japanese. Querían que sea un jardinero con un japonés. No querían que yo fuera un médico. Oh, he says, but you know what? It'd be better if you would raise cattle. So when I came to my junior year and I wanted to, um, to take the chemistry classes and pursuing that, they would not let me take it. And they, they sent me to shop. So I had to go to shop school. I learned how to do how to operate a printing press. I can still do it, except they're obsolete. They don't work anymore. They don't exist. It was not easy. Uh, the constant in my life, all through these years, was the Lord. Because we found refuge in the church. And I mean that. In the church, we went to a Spanish-speaking church, and in that church, I was able to evolve and become the person who I believe I am today. Because it was through the church and my relationship with the Lord that I kept and guarded 
that helped me to go through all these obstacles. There was one thing people liked about me in high school. I could run. I was, I was a very fast runner, 50-yard dash. I held the title for a couple of semesters or so. And then all of a sudden, they changed the, the training, and, and they said, well, now we're going to be training on, on, on Fridays, and our meets are going to be on Friday. I said, I can't do it. Why? Because Friday I have church. The coach thought I was crazy. I quit the team. He was so mad. He was so mad at me. that on my last year of high school, though I had bronchitis and I couldn't, couldn't perform because of my bronchitis, didn't go to school, did not take PE for a week or two weeks, that he flunked me on PE. And I was not able to participate in graduation in high school. But I had bought a ticket to Disneyland. I think that still goes on, right? Yeah, it was $4.50. Eat your heart out. Eat your heart out. And it was so expensive. And I still took that ticket and I went to the high school where the buses were stationed and I got inside the bus. Unjustly, not graduating with my class, but I was sitting in that and I was going to go to, and I went to Disneyland. But I heard the, the, the music and I heard the applauses and and the shouting, and, and I was sitting all by myself in that bus. No, no, pobrecito, no, don't worry about that. <laughs> I said to myself, you know, suffer the penalties as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And I processed everything that happened to me through as much as I could through the scriptures that were given to me. The scriptures that made sense out of my life. It's what formed me. It's what helped me. It's what allowed me to move on without keeping a grudge or being upset. So within a month, they sent a diploma with an apology saying that what the coach had done was illegal because I should have received my degree at that time. So high school, high school graduation was not an easy thing. But you know what? I had a call to the ministry. And so I felt this call from the Lord in a way which was very special. It was one of those days where I knew God had to do something in my life because I was not going to medical school. And the Lord worked in my heart and showed me that I did not have to go to medical school to serve him. And so I dedicated myself to serve him in the ministry. Story is long, I'm not going to go on with it. Um, and so I said, I'm going to go to Bible college. And so I went to Bible college because I thought in Bible college, it was going to be heaven on earth. It was going to be the greatest moment of my life to leave all the high school stuff with all my friends getting drunk and all my friends doing this and doing that. Now I was going to go to a place where God's people were being formed and blah, 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 blah. Well, let me just tell you that I had quite an awakening surprise, but let me move on quickly and tell you that in the days of high school, I learned several things. For instance, uh, how you spook people out, you know, the angle model of, of how close you can get the social zone is 12 feet, personal zone is four feet, intimate zone is one foot. Zone, but zone. <laughs> I had to learn how to behave among my brothers and sisters in the English world because they were different from the Spanish world. We hug all the time. Anglos don't hug all the time. And it's not bad, it's just the way they are. I had to learn also about language. Language in Spanish and English differ. The English language speakers go right to the point. You know what Hispanics do. <laughs> it, it was so funny when I would, it, we'd interview pastors and they would have to speak to the supervisor. I served several capacities and the supervisor says, you take them on for the first hour. I'll come back to finish the job in five minutes. And so they would speak, y como esta fulano, how is so and so and so and so and so and so and I did this, I did that, I did the other and finally, anyway. They, they, would, they would tell me what they were there for. And that's the only thing the supervisor wanted to hear, the last five minutes, three minutes, even better. I had to learn how to communicate that way. But nevertheless, I went through great amounts of culture shock. In Argentina, it was great. I went, came to America thinking I was going to find everything I ever wanted, and I did not find everything I ever wanted. I found everything I didn't want. And it's not no, nobody's fault. It's just 
That's how it is. So the, the idea of, of Argentina, welcome to America, the conflicts, the identity crisis, assimilation, this crisis. you have to be an American. They said also to me in high school that my name should be changed. Sabes que Enrique, tú te tienes que llamar, I, I'm going to be in trouble with this, but tú te tienes que llamar a Henry, y tienes que usar el nombre de tu mamá que es Andrews. You should be Henry Andrews. Enrique, Sonne, te queda mal. Change your name, change it legally. Yeah. Then, they meant well. In those days, assimilation was the issue. You had to become like them. And I wasn't them. I'm still not them. I am me. You think you can change this at this stage with the age issue? <laughs> assimilation, discrimination. Then there's exploration, adaptation, and then you become bicultural, but it takes a lot of time. This is from Naida, who was an anthropologist, incredible lady. She talks about the Hispanic way and the Anglo way. As I was in college, as I was trying to figure my way out, you know, uh, they say that, that, that Hispanics get drunk to confess, and the Anglos get drunk to forget. Uh, it's, you know, it's, Hispanics are pessimistic. The Anglo is optimistic. Uh, the Hispanics are often suspicious. Uh, the Anglos are often more open. The Hispanic want to contemplate. The Anglos want to understand. The Hispanic way refers to my mother's faith. But of course, the Anglo-American way is my, the faith of our fathers. The Hispanics said, seek revolution and radical change. The Americans seek reform and improvement. Hispanics, they came to this world to exploit it. But Anglos came to the new world to populate it. Hispanic way, they came to transplant the old world, but the Anglos came to create a new world. You see all these conflicts? And you walk into, into a situation where there's different worldviews, and you process life differently. And this is what happened to me and happens to every immigrant. Uh, basically, uh, going to becoming bicultural, this is what happens to you. It is not a line, it's not a straight line, it's not from A to B, it goes up, it goes down. You mix here, you mix there, you jump from this hoop, you jump through the other hoop, you understand this, you understand the other. It is continuous. Even to this day, I'm learning how to be more of an Anglo. Tough proposition. I think maybe I'm done. But it takes forever, both ways to understand. So I went to Life Bible College, wonderful college, but it was as white as could ever possibly be. And though that's the way it was. And I don't, I, they're good friends of mine. And I wanted to have a dialogue, but I had a monologue. I spoke to myself, hey, I want to get to know you. So you get drunk, to, to, you drink to, to forget, you, you drink to get, you know, I mean, come on, let, let's talk about our differences. They would look at me and they would just, Dialogue was, not, was impossible, only a monologue. Then I came across a map by the name of Juan Jose, Jose Maria Munoz from Guatemala, who asked me to translate for him in a service which I had never done before. And uh, it was a, the first time that my biculturalism and my bilingualism was made available to serve the Lord. And I discovered that after all, I could serve the Lord by being that person that I was, two cultures in one. One culture in one. The, the, bilingual, the bilingualism, in those days, we're talking about the 60s. There, were no, there was no literature on bilingualism or, or biculturalism. The literature was simply assimilation. You have to be an American. And I am an American, my way. There was a problem in, this, in, this, in, in the college, and there was some graffiti that was done. And it's a story, it's in the book with details. And, for whatever reasons, I was called to the principal's office. And I was asked if I had done that because I was the only white Mexican on campus. I felt all the Mexican people were insulted that they would compare me to a Mexican. And I was insulted because of what they thought I was not, or was. Anyway, so I, I, I left the college. I abandoned the college. I left. I could not go on anymore. And so what I did, I went to Guatemala and I spent there three years. I called Brother Munoz from Guatemala and said, can I come? He says, come on over. I went and I spent three years in Guatemala where I developed four basic principles of what I call 
uh, the bicultural leader. And, and quickly, I'll go through this. Uh, the first is the four basic principles in Guatemala for a period of three years. First of all, I learned to recalibrate my culture. I understood after three years of being among many different tribes and languages and a wonderful experience of working along with the experience that I've had in the States, is that I also brought culture to the table. And I could not avoid or escape that reality. I had to learn how to reprogram my thinking. I write, the reality is that the Argentine society put an incredibly complex culture on my life from which I can never escape, even if I wanted to. It is not that I am enslaved or determined by that culture. I am influenced by it. So I know that I am influenced, my life is influenced by the acculturation. I cannot escape it. But I had to recalibrate, I had to think through that I also have issues that I have to resolve. I learned to respect other cultures, and I do respect. Statement, all cultures are more or less equal to each other in the way they are structured to meet the needs of their members. None is anywhere near perfect since all are shaped and operated by sinful human beings, but none of its healthy, in its healthy state is to be considered invalid, inadequate, or unusable by God and humankind. Every culture, every single culture. I learned to respect the gringo with all due respect. I began to appreciate what they were doing and how they functioned. I began to appreciate my Guatemalan brothers and sisters, my Mexican brothers, and I, I brought to the table my culture, but I then learned to respect the other cultures, give them the place they deserve. Not that I was not doing that in my own, but this, this was very personal. This was very direct. Then number three, it's the, it's, I got one more. Number three, I learned the power of dialogue. All through my first time at the college, it was a monologue. But when it was, I was in Guatemala, I learned that dialogue is the key where we can talk to one another, speak our hearts. True dialogue occurs when participants hold common ground. Can there be more common ground than our faith and our love in the Lord Jesus Christ? When there, there's collaboration between cultures, a sustained, long, and direct dialogue. In willing dialogue, you will find the seeds of hope, trust, and understanding. Our God is portrayed as mainly a God of a dialogue who interacts with us, not simply a God of monologue who makes pronouncements above us. I learned the power of dialogue. So I would see, seek people, talk with people. Now, sometimes I did not get the results, but I still tried. I, I, I need to speak with people. The last one is, I learned to adjust to dance with other cultures. Each one conserves the most important of its native culture when you dance, and at the same time, one is transformed by the association. It is, it, is, it is a give and take. It is skillful blending, understanding, form of a function. Aprender a bailar con la cultura es muy importante porque significa que me atrevo a cambiar poco, que me puedo mezclar con y que puedo adelantar mi vida dándole ese lugar. Some people come to the dance and they're dressed with fine linen the dress right for the dance. And so, just think of it as a, as a metaphor, and you, you're re ready to dance, and then the other person comes and they're dressed with sandpaper all over them. If you're gonna get close, you're gonna get rubbed the wrong way. Sometimes people are not willing to dance correctly, but if you dress with the right apparel, and there is a desire to come together, to understand, to understand the moods, to understand the changes, the, the different, the, the, the different um, rhythms, rhythms, you will begin to see how important and basic this is. So those are the four basic principles for the bicultural leader, and they are basic to everything I've ever done in my life. Programs at the school, programs here, those are the four areas that I work, 
And I, I am able to do that because I understand what it means to recalibrate my culture, to respect other cultures, to engage dialogue, and to dance, not be afraid. Because as, as you dance, you don't lose your personality or your, yourself. You, you actually you are transformed in the dance. And you're better than before because of the dance. Assimilation needs to be understood in the context of today's society. Um, there is no such thing, in my view, as full assimilation. There has to be a balance between the dominant culture and the, 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 the foreign country, if I could use that word. And there has to be a middle ground. And that middle ground was, I alluded to it, at the universal American uh, culture where both groups share the same American concepts, but also are permitted and allowed to live their life outside of that, uh, that context to be themselves. So I think the church should, should engage without any fear. Uh, whatever language issues, have services in Spanish or have services in Korean, and, and have times of fellowship where all of you can come together but again, the bicultural mixing of languages from the pulpit, I don't advise. But I think you should have small groups of people so that they can vent, talk, express um, by themselves. It's, uh, it's, it's important to, to be with the group of your own language, of your own culture, and for the church not to think that they are doing anything clandestine or doing anything wrong by giving them the freedom to be themselves in that context of the church. Because sometimes um, the, the Anglo um, ministries uh, feel threatened by the, uh, the Hispanics, and, and you need to remove that threatening and say, be yourselves, go ahead, knock yourself out, express yourselves. That's how you do it. Um, you, you cannot force anybody in becoming something they were not intended to be, more or less. It's so difficult to, to repel the Anglo-dominant culture. It's there. It's here. You, you have to live with that. I, I, I really have thought many times of who do I do away with so that we will not have this influence. But then I would have to go back to Argentina. I, I really think that there needs to be a balanced approach that minority cultures are always going to be minority cultures. And uh, as a matter of fact, I was discussing this with, with our colleague, uh, Moses, Dr. Lopez. Uh, Daniel is a very good example of, of, of a young man who was taken captive to, to Babylon. Though he ascended in power, he still had to bow to, or not to bow, but he still was under the control of, of, of the Babylonian Empire and also of the, uh, the Medes and Persians. So there was, he was able to, to speak his faith and speak his, his heart, but the influence was always there. And I don't know how you get rid of that. I mean, Daniel was, I mean, the lion's uh, den and, and the fiery furnace. And I, I don't know if there's an answer to it, except you, know, you want to have people who have goodwill but there's always going to be a pharaoh that doesn't know Joseph, you know? So I think, I, I don't think you can, you can have a full answer for that. I, I'm sorry. I just don't, I just tried, wrecked my brain. I mean, how do I do this? I, I'm going to wipe out every Anglo in the United States of what? You, know, you can't do that. And it's part of the culture. You, you, you cannot help, you, you are who you are. And, and the American culture dominates because that's, that's the American culture. And so when Christ comes in and intervenes in your life and begins to change those, those areas of superiority, then you, you have a wonderful opportunity of having dialogue and, and get together. But, but it's very difficult. I, yeah, I, it's kind of a sloppy answer, but you can digest it. Well, take, take our university. We love it here. We, we have a growing program. We have 90 MDiv students, and we have 
15 DMEN students and a you know, whole bunch of them coming up. We, we do our thing, but we do it in the context of an Anglo environment. But we learn how to dialogue, we know how to talk among ourselves, but now and then I'm reminded that, you know, I'm reminded. <laughs> and I totally understand that. And I have no problems with it. I just don't think we can make America Hispanic. I would not want that for a minute. No. ¿Verdad que no, hermanos? So those tensions are there. Um, the kingdom of God, um, the Sermon on the Mount, the principles of the Sermon on the Mount, if we could only apply them to our lives, then we would have no problems, but we're far away from being able to, to get there. So. Sí, porque cuando, cuando uno baila, uno tiene que tomar la pareja, ¿no? Y comienza a bailar. Y uno tiene que mover la pareja por un lado y luego la otra mueve para el otro lado y luego para el otro lado y poquito se van conociendo y van bailando. La cultura americana, aquí viene el gringo, aquí viene la gringa, aquí viene el hispano, ¿verdad? Pero cuando termina el baile, ella se va para allá y yo me voy para acá. The dance is finished, you go your way, I go my way, but we danced and we did something together. And we did not injure ourselves, we did not hurt ourselves, we were able to accomplish something together. Mm -hmm. I dance with Bobby all the time. <laughs> we have to. Here we have to. Todos by, we have to. It's either that or, and it's. El tango, tengo todo eso en el When was I able to, to come to grips with the identity crisis? I still have the identity crisis, but that's beside the point. Um, it never ends. You're always adjusting. Siempre tú estás ajustando. But en un día, estaba yo caminando del high school para la casa y el Señor me habló. Y me dio, eh, ese pasaje me dio, estoy hablando en términos muy pentecostales. Doctor Danino, por favor, no diga nada. <risa> el pasaje de Jeremías donde dice que eh, a los exiliados que los llevó para que plantaran viñas, prosperaran, y para darles un, bueno, un buen plan. ¿Cómo va, ¿Cómo va el versículo? Planes de vida para prosperar. Y el Señor me habló a mí de esa manera, de que yo estaba acá para prosperar, y me di cuenta que era mucho más que ir a Argentina. Era ahora una persona destinada a vivir aquí. Y mi, y mi vocación ahora era, era mi inmigración. 14 años, cuando me di cuenta que eso era. Y de ese momento en adelante rehusé sentirme eh, mal, rehusé el complejo de víctima, rehusé a todas esas cosas. Y dije, voy a vivir para Dios con la medida de fe de que estoy aquí, porque Dios me trajo aquí para plantar viñas y hacer el trabajo. El libro lo dice con más claridad. First, immigration issues. You, 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 you come to the country and you have your children. Your children are growing up in, a, in an environment that is different from the one that you grew up. Um, tiene que dejar que sean americanos, que se metan en la cultura americana para que prosperen aquí. No los puede retener, tiene que dejar que sean lo que tienen que ser. Y usted como padre y, y, y como pareja le inculcan los valores de su cultura, pero son americanos y tienen que vivir en la vida americana. No pueden ustedes negarle eso, porque van a tener entonces hijos esquizofrénicos. Culturally schizophrenic children, porque no les permiten. My father, my father was always Argentinian. He was born Argentinian, he came to this country as an Argentinian, and he went to be with the Lord as an Argentinian. Nunca pudo, nunca pudo adaptarse aquí. El primer año compró una radio de ando a corta para escuchar las noticias de Argentina porque era el único lugar donde le daba la verdad las noticias. <laughs> My dad bought a shortwave radio first year mm. to listen to Argentine news because that was the only source where he got the real news. <laughs> uh, he, he could never ever blend in the country, but we did. We, we, we allowed us to do that. He wanted us to be as much as possible part of this country. Si no hace eso, cuando lean el libro, y si se inscribió, como sabe, les va a llegar regalado, va a ver la historia de cómo yo tuve que pelear con esos cuatro principios de biculturalismo 
con toda una, una, una cultura dominante que no era una cultura, era supuestamente cristiana, pero era una cultura sin redención. Porque a veces se pone difícil la cosa, pero eso la gloria va para el Señor. Y sobre todo usted que es católica, porque mi vida, fue, la iglesia católica me hizo a mí la vida imposible. <risa> Catholic Church made my life miserable. She's Catholic. But that was not the Catholic Church. No era la iglesia católica. Era la ignorancia de la gente allá. It was ignorance. It was not the Catholic Church. I don't believe that for a minute. What do you do when, um, when you, you come to this country, but you want to go back over there, and they never end the, 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 the issue between one country and the other? No sirven para nada. No sirven ni allá ni sirven acá. Tienen que convertirse a Cristo. They're very problematic. They need to come to Jesus and find out where God wants them. Because you can't be living here and going there back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You have to land the plane and serve the Lord. The Lord spoke to me and said, this is where you stay. And, and it was that day, as I was saying in Spanish, many years ago. I was 14 years old. The Lord spoke to my heart and said, this is where I want you. I want you to stay here. I've got good plans for you. You're going to prosper. You're going to plant vines. You're going to have homes. You're going to get married. You're going to have children. You're going to, be, you're going to excel in this country. Move on. So I stopped belly aching, complaining about how much I loved Argentina, which I do to this day. But I understood that going back to Argentina was not really God's plan for my life. Just like the exiles. They wanted to go back. 70 years they had to stay there. So I'm waiting when I'm here 70 years, then maybe I'll get to go back. No, it's not true. I, I understood that this is where God had me. And the idea of going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, word, it, it, it just doesn't work. They need to make up their minds where they're going to serve the Lord. ¿Verdad? Sí, yeah, ¿verdad? Should, is the book in Spanish? Yes. Have you thought of putting it in English? No. <laughs> yeah, eventually. Yeah, yo lo que voy a hacer... What I'm going to do is I'm going to Google it in Spanish and have everybody read it. <laughs> no, it would, it would take considerable work to do it in Spanish, in English, because the way in which I write in Spanish, and by the way, I did this on purpose. I had the two choices. Do I do this in English or do it in Spanish? I felt obligated to do it in Spanish because this will serve much better the Hispanic population than the Anglo population. But it will come in Spanish. It will come in English. But it will be maybe by the end of the year. Not yet. Yeah, I, I have a slide that speaks about trust. And I, I believe that's the major accomplishment of this institution with the Hispanic community. There is a level of trust. Trust is developed. Once you have trust, you can do anything. And I'm not publicly saying this simply to, to say it. But there are people that I do trust with my life here in this institution, and I do. And, and that's because we have had a long-term relationship over a long period of time of, of simply um, being faithful to our commitments and to our promises. If I say to this person, let's have lunch over there, they don't forget that. They will have lunch with me over there, or they may call me and say, I can't go, but they don't, they're, they're not standing me up. Is that the word? Yeah. There's this, this relationship of honor and integrity and respect. Through time, I able to understand people, and we're able to have a dialogue of substance. And not only do we understand our minds, but for me, we understand our hearts. And once that is established, you know, Americans love time. Time is money. And for Hispanics, time is friendship. As a matter of fact, Dr. Reisler, I said that to you the second day you were here. I said, as we work together, I want you to know that I need to be your friend. Because the only way I can work is with basis of friendship. That's who I am. And once I am somebody's friend, it's forever. Now, don't confuse it with me allowing you to do crazy things. I will correct you. No, don't, don't make that. Don't. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, it's not a blanket, well, he's my friend, nobody touch him. No, 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 no. It's, it's true friendship where we speak the truth in love. But guess what? It's not with the general culture. It's with people that live in the culture. 
because the culture without Christ is still the same way. Mira. Estoy haciendo todo lo posible para bailar con Brian. Y me está costando un imperio. Entre nosotros tenemos que acostumbrarnos a tolerarnos. Por ejemplo, ah, no, vos sos chapina. ¿Vos sabés cómo son los chapines? Ya, esto, 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 esto. ¿No? Cada chapina es diferente porque cada persona tiene diferente personalidad. Podrán tener valores en común, pero no es la esencia. A mexicanos, con los mexicanos yo no me meto porque solo Chile. Mira, mira ahí salió con Chile, ¿verdad? Tenemos que aprender a entendernos, a tener un diálogo con nosotros, a hablar, hablar, salir a comer, tratarnos como seres humanos con Cristo, siendo el adorno de nuestra conversación. En formas prácticas, yo, yo, caramba, caramba. Sí, hay, 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 que, hay que trabajar con la gente, hay que, hay, hay que hablar con la gente, hay, hay que comer como ellos comen. Hay que entender la comida, hay que entender el... el hay que entenderlos. Es, es un estudio de cultura. El problema es que, que, que aquí todos quieren ser number one. Viva México, como México no hay dos. Y dice el argentino, gloria a Dios, que no hay dos. Play of words. What do you mean my most difficult culture shock? que los cristianos necesitan ser convertidos. The most difficult shock is that, that often Christians do not deploy their Christian virtues, but they deploy their cultural un, unredeemed virtues. Instead of loving, you want to tell people who you are and you're going to tell them off. And, I, I, th that's been the most difficult thing, dealing with people who are Christians that act carnally. But isn't that everybody's problem? That's lo más difícil. Cuando, cuando me encuentro con, con líderes evangélicos, bueno, ahí lo dejamos. <laughs> well, yeah, because you, you, you have to accommodate, you, you, as a parent, you have to make a decision as to how your children are going to grow up and develop. I really think it's more of a parent, a parental decision than a church decision. Parents should go to a place where their children can be ministered correctly and adequately. And if it means that you have to go to an English-speaking service, though you may not fully understand the English, learn the English because the soul of your children is in the balance. Because I've seen a lot of children, a lot of children, who were forced to go to the Spanish church and left the church forever because they never got the word. You got to take care of your family. But I don't want to put this on top of the pastors. I want to put this on top of the parents. You should be stewards of that responsibility of your children. In my case, I never pastored a Spanish speaking church ever. God delivered the Hispanic people from me. <laughs> and my son and my daughter who are here today, They grew up in an English environment church, an English-speaking church. And at the home, we spoke Spanish and this, that, but it was English. All activities were English. And they're Americans. And they have a little bit of Argentinian and Costa Rican blood, but they've been spared from most of the Argentinian blood. And, and, uh, and, but they're Americans. They, they function here. Otherwise, they, who knows what would have happened to them. So it's a parental decision. And pastors need to know that. Because sometimes we put it on the pastor, you know, no. And the bilingual church, like I pastored the first year, it's crazy. But that's my opinion. And other people could have another. And they do. To their detriment. So uh, thank you for coming to uh, tonight's Faith Matters uh, lecture. Uh, I, would, uh, I would ask, I'm going to impose on our dean, Bobby Duke, to close us in prayer. If that's all right, Bobby, would you be willing to do that? <laughs> no, and thank you again for being here. I know over the last numerous years, Enrique and I have talked a lot about even how uh, academic theological resources and others 
are uh, ones that we need to here at Zeus Pacific be helping to generate and how there's an area that uh, we can really step into. So even our Hispanic Theological Journal that I know Daniel and others have helped with, it's uh, our way of saying that we're going to step into this space. So thank you all for being here and thank you for your friendship. Thanks for dancing with me. <laughs> Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this night. We thank you for a time to pause and reflect and celebrate a life well lived, a life that has had to have the ups and downs of uh, coming from one culture to another and, and even still uh, in life learning how to uh, work, uh, work together. I uh, thank you for all the students here. I thank you for the professors, for all the staff. And I just thank you uh, again for uh, Enrique's friendship with me and for uh, his service to APU all these years. For it's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Gracias por venir. Thank you.